I would say just a little bit about the notion of fractals generally, because this word has been tossed about here much, and it's uh, important to understand it. Fractals are self-similar curves. That means they're uh, objects made of, tin of uh, tiny versions of themselves. That's all it really means. And they can be quite simple mathematical objects, such as uh, a circle. The curve of a circle is curved uh, in the same way, no matter how large or small a portion of it you look at. It has this fractal quality. And, but most fractals are very complex. A common example of a fractal in nature is um, a fern or a feather. You must have noticed how a fern is made up of little fern-like structures, which are made up of still smaller fern-like structures uh, coming off a vein. And, and some ferns have four or five levels of these little ferns declining. Uh, until fairly recently, these kind of curves, which were really discovered and described in the late 19th century, were pretty much ignored. They were called pathological curves. The reason being that it was felt that their mathematics was so complicated that their end states couldn't be calculated, and so they were called pathological. What this, this all changed with the uh, invention of computers, because there are not problems so complicated that computers can't solve them, so suddenly the pathological curves, which before had been very hard to visualize at all, it became possible to create animated computer graphic movies of these things. And what was amazing about them was some families of these curves had uh, looked like river deltas, uh, nerve branchings, tree lines, uh, coastlines, island chains. There were was a, an astonishing tendency for some families of these curves to look like natural objects. And at first, nobody knew exactly what to do with this. Uh, IBM has programs that produce endless landscapes. You just fly above snow-capped mountain ranges with alpine lakes and then lower altitude areas with river-cut uplands, and then more mountains, and more lakes, and more deserts, and more rivers, and it just goes on. And it's being created from a few lines of computer code in a raster-scanning graphic system. And uh, immediately, natural scientists grabbed onto these things uh, to describe aspects of nature that had been previously outside the realm of calculation. Because you can perform a certain kind of, uh, right. here we are, a certain kind of almost magic with these things. As an example of how it works, once at Ojai Foundation, we were on a pilgrimage at Point Sol which is a huge beach near Vandenberg Air Force Base. And it runs for miles with a long, low sand dunes coming in. And I was walking on this beach, and it was swept clean. I mean, it was virtually, there was nothing on it. And I came upon a, a heavy black pebble. Mm -hmm. And I noticed this heavy black pebble sitting there with a little pattern around it. It had obviously been de deposited by the incoming tide. And I kept walking along this beach. And after about a while, I came upon an identical black pebble, just like the first one. And I, then I had a, a stroke of insight, or the logos tapped me on the shoulder, and I decided I would perform an experiment and I 
at the second black pebble, I, count, I turned and retraced my steps, and I counted my steps until I had returned to the first black pebble. It was like 723 steps. And so then I continued walking, uh, and 730 steps later, there was an identical third black pebble sitting uh, on the beach. Well, if I had had some credulous person with me, I'm sure I could have won big money by this method. But what is happening is not mysterious at all. It's that the sea rolling into this huge bay represents a very large unresolved set of equations for chaos and turbulence. And it sorts itself out in such a way that there are hierarchical patterns of movement and force in the tide such that every 725 steps, give or take five steps, the equation solves itself in such a way to deposit a black rock on the beach. Well, um, this, is, this verges on almost natural magic or something. And what it allows in the hands of uh, modelers, cybernetic modelers, is the possibility that very, very complex natural systems, such as the drainage of river basins, the energy economy of a rainforest, or something like that, will be found to resolve itself into rather simple kinds of mathematically describable objects. Now, uh, the thing to notice about fractals is the way they do their magic is they have nested, they are nested the same set of perturbations or the same set of value changes are nested again and again into each other on many, many levels. And uh, so that what is implied if we say that there's a fractal description of the rainforest and there's a fractal description of river systems and there's a fractal description of the coastline of the continents, what that implies is that there therefore must be a fractal in which all of those fractals are somehow subsets and that the planet itself is some kind of fractal uh, object. Well, to my mind, I mean, that's all now agreed on by these guys like Mantelbrot and Peitkin and the people who are working with all of this. But to my mind, the, the next step in that is to extend the notion of fractalness to time. And, and so one of the things that I want you to notice about time wave zero is perhaps whether it is quote unquote true or not, the way in which it uses fractals to describe phase transitions in a temporal medium implies to me that this method has great promise, whether the values that I've plugged into it are true or not. Uh, I think I said at the beginning of this, you know, this funny perception that every day is somehow like every other, which is different from the every day is made of four other days bit. But every day is rather like every other, and every week is rather like every other week, and every year and every century and every million years is rather like the one that came before. Generally, that's the rule. But what the fractal shows is how you can have this repetition and everything embedded in sameness and the momentum, if you will, of the morphogenetic field and still have occasionally completely astonishing events occur. That's the thing. How to, how to save the phenomenon of extreme perturbation and still be true to this tendency that the universe has to smooth all perturbations. 
so I wanted to just call your attention to the fact that this wave that we are discussing is a fractal. Fractals are um, described by mathematicians as occupying intermediate dimensions. They're what's another name for them is space filling curves. Would you say it's a fraction of the dimension? Yes, that if you ask uh, what is the dimension of the fractal, you will be given a number between 1 and 2, like 1.365. These, these things occupy an intermediate zone. They are neither quite two-dimensional nor entirely one-dimensional, or quite three-dimensional nor entirely two-dimensional. And it's this interdimensionality of the fractal also that holds possibility. I think... Uh, what did you say about the intermediate? Something about it being intermediate? It occupies an intermediate dimension between whole numbers. And now linguistic analysis is being carried out that shows that uh, syntax is fractally organized. Mm -hmm. That the act of uh, creating language is the act of running a fractal generation program uh, in the human neurological system and that somehow if you analyze speech, hours and hours of speech, God knows I'm aware of the fractal nature of speech because I'm always in the same place saying the same thing <laughs> but it's always <laughs> a little different. <laughs> Well, anyway, I, I, uh, the fractal thing, if you've not heard of it before, you heard it here first, and it's going to give very powerful mathematical tools to us for the description of reality. You see, really, uh, until the fractals were legitimized by high-speed computers, the only o objects we had to describe nature were the classic Aristotelian solids the cube, the perfect sphere, the ellipse, the rhomboid, the parallel, that was it. And, you know, 2,500 years we've been trying to get along with that. And obviously these things do not describe nature very well. That was the whole problem that hung astronomy for a thousand to fifteen hundred years, that they had perfect circles to describe the motion of the planets, and the planets all moved in ellipses. So then to get their perfect circles to work, they had to invent the Ptolemaic epicycle, which was this excruciatingly inelegant way of causing an ellipse to appear to be uh, a system of uh, perfect circles. If, if you want to see an example of a great mind anticipating a mathematical breakthrough, you all know the wave by Hokusai right, the great Japanese printmaker. Well, sometime, next time you see it, look at the place where the wave is coming over the top and beginning to break apart, because what you'll, you have this one wave coming up, and then it divides into two, and then they divide each into two, and each into two, and there's this wonderful fractal drip on the lip of the wave that, you know, is the product of keen, keen observation. Also, Leonardo da Vinci, believe it or not, did a series of drawings of, of uh, turbulence. <laughs> Can you imagine drawing turbulence? He, he, would, drop, uh, he would drop ink in, in glasses of water and then draw it. And he drew it with such an attention to detail that the fractal nature of turbulence of that sort is visible in the drawings. And of course there was no name for it or anything. He was just, had this guy had such an eye. No, the fractals, there isn't a, a classic place in it. What made them very exciting to me was when you give them to a good computer and it generates these things for you, they look more like hallucinations than any art of the Huichol or the Huitoto or... I mean, these things look like hallucinations. Well, so that's very suggestive because you, be, you think, 
you know, these mathematical objects look like hallucinations. Do hallucinations look like these mathematical objects because the nervous system is organized this way and we're somehow getting a, an or organizational insight into how either the physical matter is arranged or how the data is being handled. And, uh, and this may be the key, you know, if language turns out to be fractal, well then this is the key to understanding learning, memory, it sort of explains how we can be in the world because what it's saying is, you know, if you find out about this square yard of ground, you're in a much better position to deal with all other square yards of ground. Not a perfect position, but in other words, that local information has global implications. That would be the way to put it. Understand the fractals in language. What is it that's being repeated? Is it tones or wh what is the pattern? Well, um, uh, syntactical patterns, patterns of subject object relationship modified by phrases in a certain way, the fact that adjectives precede normally what they modify. Oh, like a sentence that, diagram. Yes, exactly. Okay. That there are these patterns. And, uh, you know, one of the great problems of uh, computer artificial language theory is, and Noam Chomsky wrote a lot about this, the problem of getting a machine to recognize all possible sentences as sentences. We seem to have, we do this quite naturally. I mean, every day if you live with exciting people, you hear sentences which were probably never before spoken in the history of the world and yet you immediately understand that this is a sentence, but getting a machine to achieve this kind of linguistic closure is very difficult. Now, with the parallel processing machines and fractal analysis of language, they think they're going to uh, get it, but what we may, pardon me? Who knows about that? Who's doing this work? Who does this Who kind of work? Uh, well, the language laboratory at MIT is doing a lot of it. A fair bit of it is classified because it revolves around the government funds, what are called machine translation projects, and that's doing the spade work for artificial language projects. They want to have voice-controlled fighter aircraft and stuff like this, and. Uh, you know, they begin with very simple vocabularies, but the idea is to build out, and this kind of effort will not be successful unless we really know what language is, because we're trying to get down on the nitty-gritty of it. The, the fractal thing is, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I mean, it has implications sociologically for our own psychological self-imaging, uh, for planning, uh, and yet once grasped, it's a very simple uh, notion. And I believe that, you know, it's reinforced by the natural world, that everywhere we look, there are cycles, energy cycles, astrophysical cycles, the spinning planet. But we, we have for a long time seen these things as cycles, but we've never seen them as Repeti repetitive modules of large fractal systems, which is what they really are. It isn't that the Earth always goes around the Sun the same way, it's that it more or less goes around the Sun the same way. And nested uh, systems of fractals, you know, the I Ching uses this wonderful phrase, prepotent systems of relationship and says you must not come into conflict with prepotent systems of relationship. This means do not walk into closed doors. You now, if the door is closed, please open it before passing through, otherwise you get a bump on the head. And knowing that the universe has these, this fractal structure uh, makes it possible to navigate through it, even if you don't buy into this particular version of it. Uh, fractal metaphors, fractal ways of thinking about things are uh, going to make life much easier to live in the future.
I think it, it was Janis Joplin, or some people say Andy Warhol, and that proves the point before I even tell the anecdote. Uh, anyway, one or the other of them said, in the future, everybody will be famous for 15 minutes. Well, this is a perfect exemplification of uh, a fractal sociological point of view. I mean, whichever said it, they were quite a master. These computer graphic movies of fractals, it, look, it shows you what looks like a mountain range running down to one side of the screen, and the camera focuses in on this point in the side of the screen, and mountain range flows out of it for as long as you care to look at it, hours, days, weeks, it doesn't care, just keeps blowing up this point, and you see more and more uh, landscape. This notion of local information having global implications is a, a, a cardinal principle of shamanism. You see, the idea, and it's exemplified in Bohm and Prebrahm and all this talk about holography and uh, all this, it's that locally is the information that you need to have to understand uh, distant situations. It is all there, and it, is, it achieves this through a basic organizational principle, the holographic, the hologrammatic, the fractal enfolding of information, so that uh, no matter how small a piece of the puzzle you have, if you meditate deeply enough, the entire pattern can be extracted out of it. And I think this is what wisdom must be in life. It's the ability to be handed a situation. You know, your daughter's running off with a hell's angel or your bank account is overdrawn. And knowing how to solve it by fitting it into the totality of things. I mean, usually the first step is to relax. And I maintain, you know, that these kinds of theories promote and uh, give permission to abandon anxiety, that they say it's all right, you know, it isn't, it isn't riding on the egos of civilized people, it isn't up to us to control and understand. We are, uh, we are part of a system, but the system is in governance of the situation. It is not running out of control. It has not escaped its traces and uh, is in a somehow uh, malfunctioning state. It's just that it is a process of winding things up in order to condense them down, in order to push them into another dimensional domain where everything is connected to everything else and therefore Everything is at equilibrium and completion. Om Shanti Om. <laughs> <laughs> there it is in a nutshell. <laughs>